TV18. Well, the pandemic forced most businesses to adopt digital technologies. In fact, digital technology adoption was almost on steroids through the course of the last two and a half years. Even as the pandemic has receded, digital transformation and digital adoption continues to be a big theme across businesses globally and here in India as well. To talk to us about the road ahead, for digital adoption, but more importantly, one of the big risks associated with it, cybersecurity risks, is Nikesh Arora, the chairman and CEO of Palo Alto Networks. Nikesh, many thanks for joining us here on the record. Appreciate your time. This is your first visit to India post the pandemic. Indeed. Yes. Well, thank you for having me. Well, you know, as I said, digital adoption on steroids through the course of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We have spoken through the pandemic about what you were seeing in terms of added risks on cybersecurity, and that's only going to increase. This is, in fact, one of the top risks that CEOs are penciling in into their agenda. As you look at where the landscape is today in terms of adoption, in terms of capability building, to deal with this risk, where are we on the curve? Well, it depend. You pick your favorite sports analogy, and in the U.S., they always ask the question. We keep saying whether in the first innings or the second innings of mm. baseball. I think I always answer them in cricket analogies. So it's like you know, here's the first five overs uh, of a T20 match. Because I think what the pandemic showed us was that every company, bar a few, is a technology company, because everything else vanished. Legacy business, traditional business vanished. You wanted to be in a zero-touch environment, and technology came to the rescue. So. You know, I, I had a bunch of conversations uh, mm. with people in India recently, and they're saying you know, business went up tenfold on the technology side, adoption went up across the board. So we became a very technology-reliant society across the globe. And when that happens, it expands the risk of security hacks. It expands the exposure that cybersecurity brings to your business. So clearly, that acceleration of technology, that acceleration of digitization, which, to be honest, is not stopping. It's mm. the new normal. It's going to continue. It's just exposed the cracks that people have from a cybersecurity perspective. You know, you talk about cracks, and there are many cracks at this point <laughs> yes. in time, and yes. some external, uh, which you have no control of, but many, as you point out, in for instance, dealing with cybersecurity, internal, that you do have some control yes. on in terms of mitigation. Uh, but given the challenges that CEOs are faced with, do you believe that spends on things like cybersecurity may take a hit, at least in the near term? Look, uh, this is an interesting debate. You know, there's a debate globally, as you and I are well aware of, around whether there's a recession, whether there's a soft landing or a hard landing. And there's a debate on if push comes to shove, what are people going to reprioritize? Mm. I don't think people are going to reprioritize technology adoption. I think we've all understood from the pandemic that we were woefully in, unprepared to deal with the current world, and the pandemic has brought shown a big light on it. So everybody's gone and accelerated plans for digital transformation, cloud transformations, and security is coupled with that. Because pretty much in any industry, if your systems don't recover, mm. you'll be shut down. Whether it's financial services, whether it's healthcare, the risk is just too high. So I don't think we're going to see a reprioritization of cybersecurity. Having said that, if the shock to the system is large enough and sustained enough, you will see trimming on the edges. And that trimming will impact every part of your spend, be it technology or cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the possible shocks to the system. And as you pointed out, the jury's still out mm -hmm. on whether we are going to see a soft landing, a hard landing. If this is a recession, is it going to be a mild recession? How quickly do we recover from it? What are your conversations, especially in the Valley, telling you at this point in time? Look, uh, we went to the Goldilocks period. We were risk on. Money was free. The U.S. government, all governments around the world, were pumping money into the economy because we were, we were dealing with the pandemic. That was the biggest shock to the system. We all thought the only way to ride it out was to take the uncertainty of the pandemic away by making all the other uncertainty go away. So we were risk management mode, and we managed the pandemic risk away, but we created a whole bunch of economic risks for the future, but we were able to create a short-term fix for the pandemic. In hindsight, everybody believes now you know, money was too free, money was too cheap, we pumped too much money in the economy, mm -hmm. and employment went off past the charts. You know, Unemployment is a historic low in the U.S. and many parts of the world. So we created a phenomenal scenario over the pandemic. As we've come back from the pandemic, as we ended up with supply chain shocks, we're beginning to realize that you know, this has a consequence. The mm -hmm. consequence is there is a, an inflation impact. Well, no, 
uncontrolled demand, lots of money available. People have a lot of discretionary income. They were waiting to spend money. They're waiting to get on the road. Suddenly, you see an inflation rise. And the banks and the central banks around the world have realized they have to tame inflation. Sustained long-term high inflation has serious consequences, which, which takes very long to get, get out of. So I think the idea is right. Do we have to tame inflation? The challenge is mm. how hard, how quickly, how much do we need to do? Now, if you believe they overcorrected on the exuberance end, why do you not believe they might overcorrect on the other end? So there's a risk that central banks overcorrect. They have not incorporated all the other uncertainty in the market. There is a war going on. Yeah. There is semiconductor industry shocks. There is inflation shocks. There's unemployment shocks. Winter is coming. Oil prices are moving higher. Higher. We're not quite sure what's going to happen. So with all that uncertainty, the only thing that seems to be certain, interest rates are going to go up. <laughs> yes. That, that is a very clear <laughs> certainty, uh, whether it's uh, it's the Fed moving or it's the Bank of England or it is the yeah. RBI here. Exactly uh, right. Interest rates are moving higher. But you know, you spoke about the consequences of this easy money. Uh, and one of the consequences also was the kind of exuberance that we've seen in terms of valuations. Yes. Uh, not just startup valuations, but across the board, but yes, particularly indeed. more so on the startup side, uh, given the, the previous boom and bust cycles that yes. we've gone through, the corrections that we've gone through, how do you look at what's happening currently and how long do you believe this period of pain is likely to, to continue? I mean, you think about it, as we said, you know, the pandemic scenario forced all risks to be eliminated because the pandemic in itself was a big risk. And we start going into a risk on mentality. People say, well, there, there's a backstop. Banks are backstopping me. The government's backstopping me. Money is being injected to the economy. I should care. I can go grow unabated. And we put a premium on growth. And that resulted in valuations. People said, it doesn't matter if you make money today. Mm. Money is free. You don't have to spend any money. You don't have to pay any interest. You can load on debt. You can go borrow money. You can create liquidity. So there was tons and tons of money in the economy that caused people to be in a risk on environment. They paid you know, exorbitant prices for assets. Mm. Suddenly, we realized money has a cost. And every time you add 100 basis points of cost of money, everything comes down. So what you're seeing is a re-rating of valuations in the market across the board. You're seeing it in equities because they're the fastest to react. You will see it in house prices. You will see it in cost of goods and services over time as interest rates start impacting inflation. So you are seeing that happen, which means we're back to a scenario where people have to manage risk and execution, which sets valuations at a certain pace. Now, if you're lucky enough to arbitrage that opportunity mm -hmm. and put, saved a lot of money and taken put on your balance sheet for a rainy day, you're in a good space. If not, all you've done is you had a very big meal, yeah. and you're going to suffer indigestion because you're going to have to pay for it. Yeah, well, speaking of indigestion, uh, you know, you said that it was risk on. Are we currently, or are venture capitalists currently, in the risk averse mode or the risk off mode? Look, venture capitalists have lived through many cycles. Mm. And <clears throat> I think. You and is there also need, by the way, there for introspection? Because the, the, the free lunches have been handed out for years now, also resulting in the kind of toxicity that we just spoke of. Well, we could talk about that in a second. But like you said, is our venture capitalists also in risk-off mode or risk-on mode? Like, what, what, what had happened is that asset prices were going up faster. Every six months, you saw a doubling or quadrupling of asset prices. And there was fear of missing out. People mm. were suffering from FOMO. Everybody wanted to be in because, God forbid, they missed a cycle. That happens in every up cycle. Yeah. If you miss an up cycle for three years, you made no money. So people were in there knowing that the party is going to stop. They just weren't sure when the party was going to stop. But they got you know, unexpected returns at that point in time. Like I said, if you monetize, you, you're laughing all the way to the bank. Now, the point is the venture capitalists have been around for a very long time. They understand the market. They understand how things work. They understand cycles. What you've seen is they have not gone off the table. They're more diligent. They're spending mm. more time doing scrutiny. In, a, in part, many of them are glad that the party is over because it allows them to go invest in real businesses for the long term. But I think you're done with series D and E rounds and F rounds, <clears throat> valuing companies at billions of dollars. I think you're back to seed in series A and series B, looking for entrepreneurs who've done this before, who are going to go build a business in the next 10 years, who have the patience to build for the long term. So I don't think they're in risk off mode. They're in cautious mode, they're in diligence mode, they will invest in good companies. Now, whether you have to ascribe some blame to them, you know, they're following the asset bubble. And 
partly they're playing with house money. So it becomes mm. a lot easier to play with house money because you know this vintage is going to be bad, but the next one's going to be good. Well, speaking of vintage, uh, you know, even the Indian startup ecosystem has seen its uh, its cycles. I mean, you know, the, it, it's a 20-year run so far. Uh, the last big correction was the 2015, 2016, and then we've sort of seen this exuberant cycle with unicorns being minted practically every other day. Uh, how do you look at what's happening in India specifically today? Uh, what do you make of the depth of entrepreneurship, the depth of business models? You know, I, you know, I would contend that India hasn't seen the cycles yet. And what I mean by that is a cycle is when you enter and you exit. We see a lot of investment. We see a lot of markups. We haven't seen a lot of exits. Mm. All exits are either strategic buyers buying assets or a few IPOs. And there's still a lot more unicorns which have to go through that cycle, you call it. So I think this is a bump in the road for a lot of the unicorns which have had re-rating. So hopefully many of these are robust businesses. They can survive the downturn or survive the sort of the cold winter for the next few years where they either have to go raise money at a lower valuation than they did the last time around, which I think has even more consequences in the Indian ecosystem than it has in the Western ecosystem. Because I'm not sure our regulations are designed perfectly in India yet to understand there can be down rounds down to a third. Right? So I think, I just as an observer, I'd be curious to see how that is handled. But I think a lot of the companies were building robust businesses. So it remains to be seen how they tied through these times. Um, and you know, there's going to be a healthy requirement for people to focus on profits and cash flows. And I have to give the Indian equity markets credit for that. The Indian equity markets have never quite bought into this ARR multiple or lofty growth expectations. Mm. I think the Indian market, like a lot of us in India, says, show me the money. Well, yes, clearly that has been the case as far as the new listings are concerned. Right. Uh, and, uh, and that was pre-re-rating of values around the world as well. Absolutely. So do you believe that the, uh, you know, the, the IPOs that people were expecting and many who were slated to IPO have already pulled back their plans, at least for the foreseeable future. But is that window, the Indian startup IPO window, shut for now? Like I think you can, don't want to be uh, flippant about it, but I think if you built a robust business, and you have profitability to show, or you have the path to profitability very clearly articulated and the market believes you, there's always a window for an IPO. I don't think the IPO window is contingent on lofty valuations of the market. By using the word lofty, we're implying they were above normal. Mm. So that means it's more of an arbitrage or more of an opportunistic move to go do an IPO when you believe the valuations are high. And that's great if you got away, but I think there's a difference between a venture, being a venture capitalist and being an entrepreneur. A venture capitalist, has clearly defined entry and exit criteria. Mm. They'll enter cheap and they'll leave when they make a multiple of your money. As an entrepreneur, you're stuck with the consequences. You build a business, you're with it for a long time because you still own a substantial stake in the company. You have obligations to your employees, to your customers, so you don't get to run away. So an entrepreneur has to build a robust business because it has to stand the test of time. I think from that perspective, the window's always open. Mm. The question is, is your business ready? Yeah. And if you're telling me there were businesses which had filed for IPO where they were not ready, then that's not a market problem, that's an entrepreneurial problem. So I think the market's open.